As we get to end of day one at Software Testing Conference North, we're here with Stephen Moss, who gave a talk earlier today about the importance of a quality roadmap and maybe how to put one together. Stephen, you described the role of a quality champion as that of the navigator in a rally car. Can you explain a little bit about what that means? Okay, um, so from my point of view, um, uh, we, we kind of look at this age-old conundrum, which is, you know, having... Um, quality functions that sit to the right hand side of the delivery process um, where code is thrown over the fence and from my point of view um, I, I look at that relationship of quality um, into pro uh, product or software delivery as being very much like um, as you described the rally car situation where you've got a driver who's very technical, um, you know, able to uh, maneuver the vehicle and, uh, and make many decisions as they see them in front of their path um, and the importance of the navigator to be able to help set the pace, um, to identify the obstacles that um, can come up, and be able to identify ways of mitigating that risk. Um, so the quality engineer sits in that navigator's position, whereas the, the kind of developers, um, architects, and so forth um, sit within the, um, uh, the delivery chair. I'm not saying that um, the navigator has to be a quality engineer, just someone who's going to be able to champion um, and understand those risks um, that we need to be able to assess and mitigate. You addressed a large crowd of people, some of whom might have had an established quality roadmap and some of whom may not. Can you give people in these organisations any advice on how to set one up that's actually of value to them? Okay, um, so the key thing from my point of view is making sure that a quality roadmap satisfies three things. Um, the first thing is um, an understanding of where you are now. Um, the second thing is where you want to get to. And the third thing is how you're actually going to get there. And it's, it's very easy for people to be um, getting caught into the trap of being able to define where they want to end up, um, but ne not necessarily understanding the how. And that's where um, the conversations between the teams and um, the various different functions or roles um, becomes very important in bringing everything together and saying, you know, it's great, we've got we've got an idea of where we want to get to, but how about we try this, or how about we try that? And, you know, being able to um, exist within a safe state of being able to try and fail and succeed at the same time, so. And you talked about all these people trying to succeed, hopefully together. How do you get these disparate uh, organizations with different, sorry, different organizations, disparate people within an organization with different skills um, which could all be valuable to the project. How do you get them working in harmony? Um, so from my point of view, I, I, I think the key thing is um, having a united um, uh, communication points um, across not just the, uh, the teams, um, but also the management structures. You know, that, um, this is the way that we're helping to support you and, uh, and evolve um, uh, towards a future state. Um, so when we're talking about uh, bringing the roles together within a team. Um, it's about setting the understanding about you know, what it is you're trying to achieve. And uh, to throw out another analogy, I kind of look at it from a, a kind of sports perspective, you know, a, a, say a football team. Um, so you have your uh, players who on the, uh, on the match day are very self-organized. Um, they're responsible for the ultimate outcome of the game. Um, but um, the role of the management and the coaching structure is to be able to prepare them for that uh, match day, um, to be able to align them to a way that they m uh, may be more beneficial from uh, performing, um, and likewise to be able to set down an expectation of you know the rules, the, the, the rules of the game, the, the things that they can and can't do, um, but that they have the freedom to control once they're out on the field. One of the things that you said earlier on was to do with the, the qualities that you would expect of a modern tester, let's say. What are your feelings on what a modern requester requires? Okay, um, so from my point of view, a modern tester um, shouldn't really be too disparate from um, a, a more traditional tester. At the end of the day, a a good quality engineer or test engineer is defined by um, their craftsmanship. You know, wanting to learn more, wanting to evolve, wanting to um, uh, evaluate what they've already done and think about ways of being able to approach that more effectively the next time should the, a similar or the same kind of uh, uh, situation be encountered. Um, 
I, I, I'd want um, a quality engineer to be curious about tech. Um, so, you know, curious about the way that the product that they're working with is being constructed and, um, and how they can um, grow skills that are going to be able to provide more information into their feedback process. And you said that the important thing was to be curious. Do you envisage anything coming over the hill that a tester should be particularly curious about or an organization should be curious about? And how markedly will that change what a tester should be able to do, what skills they have, and how they should operate? Um, so there, there's many avenues. Um, so I, I think there's a massive scope for improvement within um, performance-related um, QA activity. Um, so moving away from this kind of mythical uh, sense of uh, performance testing being hard um, and starting to break it down into, um, into chunks that are more manageable. So identifying the, uh, the longest running queries within the product um, and setting a, an, ex uh, an expected um, query response time that they can work towards. Um, starting to measure those things and be able to um, see what the impact is regardless of whether it's on a small base test environment or a large scale test environment. And I see security as being a very big thing that, you know, obviously we see it in the news all of the time that, um, you know, uh, customer data was breached here, there and everywhere. And I think um, the key thing is moving towards more of a, an in-development security testing cycle as opposed to relying on spot checks here and there or relying on just um, expecting that, you know, paying attention to the OS top 10 is going to be beneficial to the overall outcome of your uh, security product. I mean, at the end of the day, um, we know that security is about staying ahead of the threats, not just maintaining what's already known about. Um, those are difficult challenges. Um, so um, I see a greater investment in that space. And I also see that um, the way that we um, work with large data sets is going to be, uh, be a very big uh, thing to focus on over time because uh, we're moving towards a, an ever-increasing world where companies are trying to embrace big data um, or, or uh, aggregated data from many different sources um, and trying to make sense of that. And on one side, you know, we see the, uh, the movements within the data scientists um, uh, profession, but I think there's a very strong sense that um, over time there's going to be a piece of how do we start to bring that understanding back into the testing uh, practices and the delivery processes and how do we how do we use that to inform some of the decisions that we're making around what to cover and why well thank you very much Stephen. you're welcome thank you very much <laughs> okay <laughs>